All right, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Living the Dream podcast. Today on the show, we have Mamika Cooney, who is a leading faith-based Christian mindset author and speaker known as the personal trainer for your mind. She empowers ambi- ambitious Christians to rewire and renew their mind. Mamika, how you doing? Hey, good. glad to chat to you again. You know, we had fun the last time we had a conversation. I'm like, there's so much to talk about. So I'm ready for today. It's going to be fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to jump in. So why don't you go ahead and start with just telling us a little bit, a little bit of a refresher about yourself and what you like to do for fun. Mm, Good question. Well, uh, as the bio said, um, I like to call myself a personal trainer for your mind. And the reason for that is that I went through a stage where I was a hot mess. I hit the wall big time, burnout, breakdown, typical. I'll admit I was the you know, belong to the perfectionist anonymous, always pushing and going until eventually dropped. Um, and I'd realized, you know, there, there had to be a better way to have doing life. I had to find the joy and spark my, you know, and even looking back, I had lost the plot of what I started uh, out to do with my career when I was younger. And it kind of, you know, life comes at us. We, we grow up and have to do the adulting thing. And then we have choices we have to make. And somehow along the way, we can either get lost or, or, um, Things can be delayed or we can get, you know, diverted in the wrong direction. But suffice it to say, looking back at my um, my sort of history and my it's all been great learning to get me where I'm at today. So really what I'm passionate about is really helping people to get unstuck from where they are, like that frustration of I know I should be doing bigger things. And I have these goals, you know, these dreams and goals that you've had in your heart, maybe this God given vision that you know that you were born for more. Right. And yet you don't feel like you're aligning your life and your your current situation is aligning with where you know you put your potential is. And it's like the, the the difference of being on the two on you know waiting to step over a bridge that you cannot see. And you, sometimes we just have to take that leap of faith and take the step and the bridge and the steps start to make themselves known. So long story short, I had um my whole background is I'm from South Africa. I was born and raised there. My husband and I met and married uh, childhood sweethearts, and we immigrated twice from South Africa to England and England to the USA, and we've been here since 2006. And in that process, um, my husband is an entrepreneur, and we've both been entrepreneurs our whole working careers, started you know, four different businesses, and we've had to learn things the hard way. <laughs> We haven't really, there's never been a straight line to success, right? It's kind of looks like this. Um, And we have three kids, two young adults and an almost teenager. So we've also had to endure some life lessons that didn't really come with an operations manual, especially for us parents out there. We wish our kids would come with some how-to directions, but unfortunately we only get those revealed to us along the way, just like life, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And really, I... About seven years ago, I really hit the wall. I'd been pushing, 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 hit burnout, breakdown. I'd lost a family member to cancer. I had uh, one of my children was having a mental health crisis. I had a business failure and I literally just couldn't take it anymore. And I just fell apart and I'd realized something had to change. I just couldn't continue at this pace. It wasn't sustainable for me, for my health, for my my marriage, my family, like everybody was getting affected. My unhappiness was bleeding out on everyone else, right? And it's only when I had my own come to Jesus moment about, okay, what what am I doing here? And why, what was I sent here to do? Like, I'm very mission-based. Like, I know God sends us here with a mission and we kind of had to figure it out along the way. And when we can get realigned with putting ourselves back on track, that's when we find we have momentum. So Typically, when we're feeling stuck, is like we feel like we can't move forward, we can't go back. But the more pressure we put, like I always think of it like being in a car, right? If you've ever driven a car and it's got stuck on the side of the road, we have to call roadside assistance because this car ain't moving. Either you have a flat, you've run out of gas, or the head gasket's about to blow. Either way, you have to stop and get help, right? You either need to get a tow or get someone to come and help you. You just cannot keep going on an empty tank. You cannot keep pushing your vehicle or your body and your mind and your and your, your soul past its limits. And oftentimes what happens is people find this a very strange concept, but my, my whole th- philosophy is you have to slow down to speed up. So if you want to be able to, you know, drive this journey called life and you want to get to your destination in one piece and you want to be able to, you know, make it a worthwhile journey, you have to have all the parts and you have to service the vehicle. 
So sometimes a speed bump or, you know, a, a losing a family member or having a child in, in, with a, having issues or, you know, a, a challenge at work or any kind of crisis in life, I always like to think of it as like a slowdown sign. Or like, you know, we go on the highway and sometimes we're going so fast, we don't see the exit and we kind of miss the exit. And I always kind of think it's a great sign for us to kind of take stock with where we were at. So even being stuck can feel frustrating. It's actually a good thing because it's having you stop and reassess where you want to go. Because if any anybody's been on a train and or, or a plane or a car and it's going 100 miles an hour and nobody's hitting the brakes, you know what's going to happen, right? You're going to crash and burn. Mm -hmm. So this whole concept of being stuck can get very frustrating, especially when we've ignored the signs. We've just like, I'm just going to go, especially for us go-getters out there. I'll be the first one to admit you know, I've had to give up my membership to Control Freaks Anonymous because it ain't working. I, you know, really had to just hit the brakes, stop on the side of the road, go get some AA help and get them to come, AAA, come and tow me out of there. And I had to do some work under the hood because sometimes we need to, you know, retire and stop doing something to put new tires on to take us on a new journey. If you want to get on the highway, there's no point in having snow chains you know on your vehicle when you're trying to drive it's like using the wrong tools for the wrong method um and, and this often comes as a shock especially for us adults who think we know everything because we know we really don't we're just all guessing life is just a whole big fat guess but then we realize what we did before ain't working is frustrating too but i always love to say if you've got your situation where you're not quite sure what to do it's a great opportunity to hit the reset button and to go let's go back to basics let's go back to figure out who i am internally like what do I what do I like what what did I like when I was five like what did I enjoy doing as a kid um and and I like to call it going back to your factory settings like what were you made to be let's strip off the layers take off the masks and really get down to redesigning and re being the architect of your life and saying let's put the pieces in the way we want it and just like when you build a house it's you know you have this idea you, you want to reno the house and you have this beautiful like architectural vision of what this house is going to be but you have to go through the messy middle of breaking things down pulling the walls down pulling up the carpets and it kind of looks messy and if anyone's ever done a house reno or renovation in the house you know you're like oh my gosh what am I doing this looks what did I get myself into and how can I get out of this and you know the only way out of it is through right yeah. <laughs> you have to just keep moving forward so I think the fact that you know if your listeners are listening today the fact that you're here today and you're hearing this and you're saying, okay, I know something has to change, you know, kudos to you, which means you finally, you're at step one, which is awareness. Um, and part of the process I like to teach people, um, I have a brand called Unstick Your Mind. I have a book and a course that goes along with that. And through the years of having gone through this process, like my entrepreneurial background, I also love sports psychology because I'm a competitive figure skater and I still do that now in my age, even though my, my kids roll their eyes at me every time I get the leotard on, but I'm like, don't care. <laughs> and I just love this concept of thinking that, you know, you're never too old to do anything. It's never too late. Today is a great day to start over and you get to choose. You don't have to be doing anything. Like I would say we want to swap the ought life. Like I ought to do that or I should do that to I could do that. Yeah. And we want to swap our can'ts or our won'ts to cans. Like a, what's the saying? Swapping our cans to cans, making them into something gives you more of a creative outlook. So if you find yourself saying, um, I can't do that, I can't do that, really what you're doing is you're giving your agency away. You're making it seem like your choices are based on other outside circumstances. But if you swap it for I won't, that puts you more in the driver's seat. Like, no, I won't eat that today because it's not going to be healthy for my body or um no I, I choose not to or I won't stay out late tonight because I know I have to get up early tomorrow morning instead of like oh I can't so I think that is also part of the awareness key is just saying I'm in the situation acknowledging where you're at and actually seeing it as a blessing in disguise because you're like oh wow I actually get a chance to do a do-over mm -hmm. um yeah so hopefully that will get us started on the path and there are three other steps which we can definitely go into, but I don't know. I'll, I will stop talking and let you interject. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I love it. I love that you kind of hit the first step there, which is awareness. And so I'm just curious when you kind of hinged on the point of like awareness, but there's also like a sub point there of like choice and realizing that you have a choice to move forward and making sure that 
you take advantage of the power of that choice is part of that awareness also realizing that your choices put you where you are today? Yes. Because there is a saying which I think is very, very true, and it took me quite a few years to actually acknowledge this, is that you have to take 100% responsibility for 100% of your results, meaning where you are in life, the choices you've made are because of the choices you've made. We cannot blame other people, the weather, the politics, the government, the circumstances. And this often comes out when people say, this doesn't make me happy. So let's look at this a little deeper. What is happiness exactly? We've heard the we know there's a book and there's a movie in pursuit of happiness. But if you look at the word happiness, it comes from the word happenings, which means events, which means things, circumstances outside of us. So if we constantly are looking for other people to make us happy or a job to make us happy or a bank balance to make us happy or the weather to make us happy, we are always giving away our responsibility. We're always feeling like we're the victim that it's, oh, well, this person's lucky or this person has, you know, got some insider knowledge that I don't have. It kind of, you're giving away your own agency and power and realizing you have the choice to decide, you know, to be a victim or a victor. And the difference between the two is that the victim stays stuck and says, oh, I feel sorry for himself. Woe is me. I'm going to sit and, you know, do nothing. Where a victor goes, okay, I understand this is happening. Let me take responsibility and figure out how I could fix this. Or even better yet, learning from our mistakes mm -hmm. so then we can use them as fuel to move forward. And that's why only when you can make that decision and say, you know what, I can't blame the family I was raised in, the country I was born in, my uh, the lack of money, the lack of time or opportunities. It, that's never the thing. The problem is never the problem. It's the way you're thinking about the problem that's the problem. Because here's the thing is, as human beings, we have choice. And we have the power of choice, which is what's the big difference between us and animals, right? Is that we have that free will. And that's one thing God will not interfere with is forcing us to do something. He doesn't want drones. He wants free thinking people to make these choices, right? So I always say you have responsibility for yourself. And it's amazing how much freedom comes when you take that responsibility. And you know, what? I'm not going to, even though there was a bad breakup or a, a bad, bad business decision, I'm just going to pull myself together and say, what can I learn from it? Take what you need, throw out what you don't, and then move forward in taking another step and realizing it's all growth. Everything is more of a growth mindset, which is even why I prefer to call growth goals, not just goals. Because mm -hmm. I know us perfectionists out there can sometimes be a little hard on ourselves when we don't achieve the goal exactly the way we want to. We just but I kind of, <laughs> yeah, it's like <laughs> just letting it almost like, oh, so I do like Elsa, just let it go. Like have a two, have an idea where you want to go. But like going in the car, right? Like you're going to go on vacation. We need to put the GPS coordinates to know where we're going. But along the way, we might be diverted by to take another route because there's an accident here or there's there's we can go and stop and get a, a refreshment along here. Like having more of a flexible approach to how we do things is going to be far more enjoyable because then coming back to the happiness thing, once you realize that you're in control, you then get to choose joy of happiness because there's a difference between the two happiness is always oh well this is happening to me or it's happening in the world and there's no there's no control there's no agency there's it's a very frustrating place to be instead of we, we say i choose to be joyful no matter the circumstances that even though this might not be hard and it's actually the neuroscience has shown that when you can get into an attitude of gratitude it's not just cliche it actually works it rewires your brain to start looking for the positive sides of life and you start to then grow that area of your brain. So, you know, the whole always look on the bright side of life, the song yeah. that is super true. The same way as the other saying I love is what you focus on grows. So if you are focusing on the negative news and listening to all the negative Nancy's in your, on your, in the back seat, it's going to make this a miserable ride. So if you can decide, you know what, doesn't matter. It could be raining. I'm just going to sing my happy little song and just say this too shall pass. But the joy is finally the gratitude in the moment that what can I be grateful for? Wow, I'm actually in a car that works. Or yay, I'm actually, I have a job. Or wow, I actually have a roof over my head. And sometimes it comes back to the basics. And I think that is such an understated um, skill that uh, so many of us lack. And it really comes down to emotional development and regulating your emotions and how you react to these situations. So, yeah. I love that. Yeah. 
I like that a lot. And just how gratitude and what you focus on grows and it actually rewires your brain. Like, I think a lot of people will be skeptical about like the positive thinking or the gratitude or the speaking positively or not saying negative things, but all of it really is like literally rewiring your brain. And so curious though, when it comes to earlier, you were talking about a leap of faith. And after this question, we'll jump into step two. Um, but earlier you were talking about a leap of faith. And I feel like a lot of times there's fear stopping people from taking a leap of faith. But then sometimes that fear can be disguised as something that is good, like stewardship or like, you know, taking care of your family or being obedient, whatever it may be. Like a lot of people feel stuck. They feel called somewhere, but then they also think they have a really good reason that is keeping them where they are. And what would you say to that person? Yeah. Well, here's the thing about fear. We all experience it and we will always continue to experience it. But here's the choice. We get to choose how we react when we feel fear. So fear, if you think about it, is actually an emotional reaction. It's your nervous system reacting to, to, to stimuli. So we stimulation comes through what we see, what we hear, what we touch, all our senses, right? And oftentimes when we have um, like uh, our nervous system has a memory. So if you've been through a traumatic event, your body actually remembers it. So that's why a lot of people who have, you know, traumatic PTSD is their body is constantly like setting the rewind button and making them go through that, that experience again and again and again. And so really what we have to teach ourselves is how to regulate our emotion through the fear. So that whole, I know it sounds cliche, but it's so true. Do it afraid. Because the only way you get over the fear is to keep pushing through it. Because here's the thing. It's really, it's the anticipation. This is what anxiety is. It's the anticipation of the worst case scenario happening. But oftentimes the fear of the event is worse than the event. Mm. Like I know when my kids taking them to the dentist for the first time, they had a filling. They would, my youngest one, she threw such a, a belt down and oh my God, the world is gone. And but by the time we got there, give her a little bit of happy gas. And he goes, oh, is that done already? I'm like, Yeah. Like, really? <laughs> so all that drama and anticipating the worst and 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 really, don't even get me going, I'll get on my soapbox now, ranting about this whole societal acceptance of anxiety as an identity, because anxiety is a feeling. It's an emotional energy that goes through your body, through your nervous system. Something triggers it. And usually a lot of the stuff that triggers us is something from our past. And usually we went before the age of 10. Isn't that shocking? Uh, as the stuff we do as kids eventually affects us as adults if we don't become aware and fix it. But the good news is it is fixable. Like if we can turn around and face the fear and say, I see you fear. I know you, 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 that is my brain putting the brakes on my potential because it's trying to keep me safe. Your brain is wired to avoid discomfort. Because if you think about it, back in the day when we were living, you know, I'm from South Africa and I know what living in Africa looks like, right? In tribes, chasing, running away from hungry lions was actually a thing. So part of that fear was to keep us alive. So oftentimes, if you think about it, and I have in my book, I wrote, I wrote um, Unstick Your Mind, I love to talk about th the three T's, the toddler, the teenager, and the therapist. We have three of those personalities in our head that our brain sometimes gets triggered. The, to the toddler will have a complete meltdown. And if ev every anybody's ever seen a two-year-old having a tantrum, you can't reason with the toddler. You have to wait right. for them to go through that. <laughs> Calm it down. Let's breathe. Let's just get you back to your happy place. And then we have the teenager, which is totally apathetic and like, Ugh, whatever. Ugh, I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel motivated. I don't want uh, procrastination. I don't want to do it. Like, uh. And then you have the therapist who's the adult in the situation who has to say, okay, I understand you feel that way. But if you just make this one choice, you will feel better because you're not teaching your brain and the toddler and the teenager when we do good things, good things happen. Yay, you did it. So you got out of bed on time today. Yay, celebrate, right? So I always think we have this conversation, this tape that goes on in our head. And part of the choice is who's in control? Who are yeah. you giving the microphone to? Are you letting that toddler ruin your day? Like before you even get out of bed, you decide you're going to have a bad day. So you're just going to have a strop and you're going to sulk all day. Or you're going to be apathetic like the teenager who just refuses to do anything and be rebellious against what you know is best. Or are we going to decide, I'm going to choose today to be grateful and to be joy. And I'm going to find the things that spark joy. And I'm going to focus on those so those grow. Mm -hmm. So things like I don't have notifications on my phone. I don't watch the negative news. I've like put 
the blinders on and only focus on what I want to grow. So if I want to grow my self-concept or I want to grow, like learning any skill, right, requires focus. And here's another word people don't like, discipline. Discipline is required in our thinking as well. It's not just about getting a hot beach body, going to the gym. Most of our work needs to be done in our mind. And I think this is why mindset work and or mindfulness, like the world likes to talk about, is such an underrated skill because what it does, it helps you to hit the pause button, have a conversation and readjust those three conversations going on in your head and decide who's going to take control. And then you start to take the steps and then you start to find momentum because you know that whole concept of what's in motion stays in motion. If we can get that motion going of that first getting the flywheel just to start going, it'll eventually start to maintain itself. So the hardest part is starting. And if you can just take that one step, your brain goes, then you can go, yay, now we can do it again. Did it again. Yay, we can do it again. And you just keep motivating yourself and staying in that positive mindset. And eventually just a few degrees every day, a little degree here, a little, a little, a smarter choice. You're building your confidence. You're rewiring your brain to realize this is the path. Oh, this is how we do things like learning a language. You just have to keep practicing. Like I'm a, a adult figure skater. And the only way that I'm going to learn something is to keep doing it again and again and again. And I know it will fall and I'll fail, but that's part of the process. I just, I've accepted that as the worst case scenario. And I'm like, okay, what's the worst thing can, that can happen now? So what? I've already lived through what the worst case is. So it's not that bad. So anxiety, pff, whatever. <laughs> and when you get to that situation, you become really calm and you realize your emotional regulation is part of your emotional intelligence is you get to decide, are we going to react? Like all of us have one of those friends who knows how to really poke the bear and trigger us. And be like, you know what? I don't hear you. La, 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 la. Yeah. Put the elevator <laughs> music on and just go, I don't hear you. <laughs> I got you. Well, take us into step two now. So we know step well, one. Well, we've kind of really gone over step two. So step one was awareness. And step two really is figuring out where you are right now. So part of this is uh, understanding, you know what? I'm feeling stuck. I know I want to change. I don't like the status quo. I don't like being where I want to go and being aware of how you feel. And even we call it somatic awareness, like in, in the neuroscience world, in the, in the therapy world, they call it uh, somatic awareness is being in touch with your body. So like, for instance, if you know, you like, if you're ever going to go and speak on stage, those butterflies, that, that, that feeling of nervousness, that's your body reacting to the outside stimulus, right? And knowing where you feel like sometimes people feel anxiety, like in their upper chest here, or they feel pain and, you know, in between their, their solar plexus, like when somebody you feel like you've had a punch to the gut, you know, those kind of sayings. Um, grief is a lot is often in the shoulders. So sometimes we like our body is trying to teach us something. So we want to get in touch with that. And a lot of ways of really helping yourself do that is to kind of just stop your, yourself in the moment and say, what am I thinking? And what am I feeling right now? Like, let's take stock of where we are right now. Is this what I want to be feeling? Is this what I want to be thinking? And then when we 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 are able to get that awareness, then the third step is to think about where do I actually want to be? Like, I might be here right now, but like, where's the GPS coordinates that's actually like imagine? And here's another thing about neuroscience is if you start thinking of new opportunities and you start what I call visioneering, engineer the vision of where you want to go and don't think small, think big. We never want to make a decision on our vision based on what we have right now. We want to make a decision on what the vision looks like. And if it doesn't scare you, it's not big enough. You know, you want to feel like it's pushing you out of your comfort zone because when you are feeling uncomfortable, that's a great sign. It means you are breaching the boundaries of your current comfort zone. And just like an elastic band, you have to push and, pr and, and, and put some like effort into pulling it. And it feels a little stiff at the beginning, but as you start to do it more often, it becomes more malleable and it starts to get, you, you get used to it because that's really what keeps people engaged in building even intelligence is going, pushing yourself just a little bit past your comfort zone. That's challenging, but achievable. So we don't want to be like, Hey, I want to be a millionaire ne next week. I'm like, yeah, um, okay, let's, let's get real, honey. That's not exactly going to happen, but we can get you there maybe in five years or 10 years. Let's what, what will it take to get you there? Right. Um, and then having that vision, I think is so important because, you know, this is the thing is I, I come from a coaching background and, um, you know, there are, I have friends who are therapists and psychologists and, you know, bless them, they know they do their work. But what I don't like about the model of keeping people stuck in the past 
is they stay stuck in the past. They don't want to think of where they want to go. And I think this part is a very underrated part um, and and talk, not a really well talked about area is helping people dream. And I mean, I know you love to talk about this, you know, helping people dream and, and set goals and not just goals like, Hey, one day I want to do this thing. It's more like growth goals. Like I want to be able to walk, go for a jog three times this week. And if you did it once, great, celebrate, right? It's better than zero. And having the, that movement and momentum because everything grows, you know, the whole concept of, um, um, you know, compounding interest just takes a little bit today and you just keep doing it consistently because consistency is better than a big things, big effort. Like if we look at how these professional athletes, um, and, you know, really achieve great things, it's never the big things that m make a big difference. It's the little things they do every day. It's the it's, little tiny things it's just that add up. So crazy to think about, <laughs> like every well, look at nature. Like you plant a seed, mm -hmm. you you can stare at the ground all you like. You're not going to see the seed grow, <laughs> and the tree ain't going to pop out the minute you're staring at it. Yep, <laughs> it's going to take a hot minute for that thing to germinate. And a lot of the time, it's happening underground, and we don't see it. But just like nature, if, unless you have one of those special cameras that you know fast forward, what do you what do they call stop motion? And it's like you can see it grow. And you're like, <laughs> oh right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think it's such a natural human tendency to think, oh, I need to go big and that's how I'm going to achieve this thing when the real answer is like, it'd be better if you worked out for two minutes a day as opposed to two hours once a month? Well, I think it's also the society we live in, like this modern society, everything is in go, 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 go. And everyone thinks you've got to go big or go home, which yes, in some ways, but, in, but if you think about it, even our grandparents and generations before, they had patience. We don't have patience. We all want to be an overnight success, but I'm sorry, honey, nobody can be an overnight success and sustain it because yeah. you don't have the discipline and you don't have the maturity to maintain it. Mm -hmm. You have to, if you earn something, you have, when you've earned it, you re you respect it more and you take care of it better. Just like, you know, this whole, you, you know, I don't know what the stats are now, but I, the last time I read it about um, lottery winners, Within five years, they've lost everything and sometimes even in more debt than they were when they started because they don't have the, the emotional and um, energy and discipline to maintain the money and that because they haven't really gone through the process of learning how to be a good steward. And that's important as part of any kind of learning is that you cannot jump ahead as much as you'd like to think this great, grandiose idea is going to be an overnight success. It doesn't work like that. And of course, you know, all the movies try to show us that, you know, just automatically fast forward, da -da -da -da, microwave technology, right? Um, and I just think we need to go back to the whole appreciating that th good things take time. Yeah. You know, it's like takeout versus a, a home cooked meal. Like what is better for you? You know, we all know that nutritious getting organic products and eating nice, uh, eating properly is always going to be better for our health. So this whole get rich quick thing and wanting to fast results, we have to realize that sometimes it's actually, it's more of a curse than it is a blessing. Because even if you look at society like um, celebrities, you hear they, oh, oh, all of a sudden they get famous. And then especially when they're young and mature, why do you think they end up turning to drugs? When sometimes even worst case scenario, they, they, how many of the stories have we heard of them ODing? Because they've reached these high levels and they don't know how to maintain that level of performance that it eventually kills them. And I'm like, that is so sad. What a waste of great talent because they were never told or taught how to emotionally regulate themselves or how to make mature decisions. And I, so I said, fast isn't great. Fast is not better. Slowing down to speed up is better when you're being more in control because you want to be a safe driver, right? You want to get there. And I'm like, honestly, I'd prefer to go in style. I'd rather have a nice car that works automatic and has the air conditioning and the leather seats. And I don't want to be trying to, shove a jalopy down the road and with patchwork and duct tape and, you know, yeah. backfiring every two seconds. That's not the style that I prefer to drive at. So we have the choice. We can take the car in and get it reassembled, refixed, retired. So then we can get back on the road and we can really finish the race that we were put on this earth to finish. 100%. I love that. I want to backtrack a little bit when you were talking about goal setting, it was like, yeah, there's the goal setting where it's like, here are my dreams, here are my goals. This is the business I want to build. This is the place I want to go. This is the family I want to have. There's that. But a more potent form of goal setting is the 
instead of a big goal five years out, you bring that big goal five years out into a daily action of like, I'm going to run three times this week. And if you get one of the three, you celebrate it, right? I want you to tell me um, about how we should go about celebrating those small wins. Because it's also, you want to celebrate consistently. So you don't want to have a big celebration every time. You want to have small ways that you can celebrate yourself and push yourself forward. So what are some ways that people can do that? Definitely. Well, how we celebrate the wins in, in on our path to growth. And this is why I say like, you know, it's good to have a bigger goal, but it's also good to break it down. Like even the way the brain works, they actually found studies that it takes 64 days to break a, a old habit or create a new one. And so I always like to say with my people that are my students that I teach, go for a 90 day concept. Like if the business world can do 90 days, you know, it's within reach. It's not, doesn't seem so far out. So if you had to break that down even further, like what do we do this month? What do we do this week? What do we do today? And celebrating that means instead of like, it, again, it comes to the conversation we have in our head. Instead of like, I know women are terrible at this. You didn't do the nine things on your list. You had 10 things to do, honey. And you are so terrible because you didn't do that. You address that, that bratty little teenager who's trying to accuse you in your brain. And you say, no, we actually did this one thing. That took a lot of effort. And I'm super proud of you for doing that. And often talking to yourself in that fashion mm. um, as a way of telling your brain, you know, this is how we treat ourselves and this is how we celebrate. So whether it's like, I mean, for me, celebration can be go taking a nap. Like I just finished writing this book and I was in three weeks of <laughs> and realized I had to take a break. So my, my version of celebration was, yay, I wrote a chapter, go take a nap. <laughs> yep. Yay, I wrote a chapter, go make a cup of tea. Or, you know, yeah, I actually made it to gym today. Then I actually get to eat a piece of chocolate or kind of rewarding yourself for the little things, whatever that looks like. And just, and it's like anything in excess isn't, doesn't taste as good. But yeah. when you've earned it, when you've waited for it, when you've worked for it, that is actually the key to growth and success. It's not the actual thing. It's the growth we achieve along to achieving the goal which is the most rewarding so here's the thing people don't like to hear but the work is the reward the end goal isn't the reward it's the actual work and your self-growth to how you've grown is actually when you look back and this is why i'm a big proponent of journaling or writing down your goals or at least putting some form of um measurement so if you say by the end of this year i want to do this this and, and, and like say what lose weight make money whatever you can then backtrack it to make it a monthly or a weekly goal that even if you don't reach that final goal if you look back those small degrees of improvement you've made is still a win because if zero is zero right if you did nothing you would have nothing so even if you've got two percent growth it's better than zero yeah. um and again it's and it, it's just part of rewiring your brain to say this is how we do things we're making a new neural pathway to say this is how we celebrate this is what success is it's not pining for what we should have, what would have, could have have, or what somebody else has. Comparison is the worst. Stay out of that. Uh, that drains your energy completely. It's you against you. How are you better today than you were yesterday? Yay, I didn't lose my temper today. Yay, I didn't like, you know, get road rage today. Yay, I actually, you know, managed to remember to buy milk before it ran out. Yay. You know, these are all tiny little wins. And I know they sound like, oh my gosh, it's so late. But when you're retraining yourself, yeah. Again, like when you're a parent, like if you're teaching your child to walk, we don't yell at them when they fall down. Oh, you're so terrible. You're never going to learn to walk. I don't ever hear a parent talk like that. We're like, yeah, you did it. That's okay. Let's do it again and do it again and do it again. And then eventually becomes muscle memory. I mean, I don't know about you, but the last time I don't really think about walking. I just do. I yeah. just, one leg goes in front of the other. The body takes over the brain nose and I don't have to tell my heart to pump blood. I don't have to have my, my, you know, nervous system do things with on on cue. Uh, we have bec we've become used to that, and I we learn as humans to function. So if we can learn to do one thing, we can learn to do all things. If we make sure we put our mind to it, and we just allow ourselves to know, you know what, I'm in control. And for me, you know, as a woman of faith, I say, you know, I always ultimately say God's in control, and He knows how this wiring inside here all works. So how about I go with his plan because he built it, he made it, he knows how it works better than I do. And that way then you just can sit in the back seat with your head sticking out the window, enjoying the ride. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um the the little celebrations over the smallest things, you brought up the point that it may sound silly, right? 
But when we think about it, we did the exact opposite to build the current negative state that we have. Like we start criticizing ourselves for every little thing. And that's what how a lot of people live their life. And it's like, look at how your mindset is on the day to day. And then like, imagine if it was just always positive or always celebrating yourself or always, you know, expressing gratitude, like the same extent to your negative, you would be positive and your life would go in that um so it's a good it actually works it actually works there's a thing that they say you know our minds are naturally more negatively biased Mm -hmm. so you actually have to do a three to one ratio so for every negative word you do you speak to yourself you have to have three good words just Mm -hmm. because of the way that our brain is naturally we are naturally negative ninnies that want to just see the worst case scenario um, because it comes back to that safety aspect of our brain always expecting that there's going to be a danger around the corner so if we keep thinking a conversation with someone who triggers us as danger we have to remind ourselves three times to be kind and to step away and to calm down. So you almost think like we are fighting our biology in some way. And of course, living in a negative society, if you keep feeding it with negative news or negativity, you just, you're just feeding the hungry monster. So it's kind of like if you know that you have to go three times to retrain yourself, eventually it's not going to be that hard because you'll be fit. You'll be your, your mental muscle, just like if you go to the gym, if you've trained it at first, it's going to seem like ugh, starting an exercise program is the worst because you feel like, oh, I'm never going to get there. And you don't see any momentum, but it's just consistently showing up. And eventually you you increase and increase and increase. Um, and eventually it'll become habit. But most people don't go past that uncomfortable stage because it's easy yeah. just to be negative and just to go back to the way it was. Mm-hmm. So it's, again, it's a choice. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, take us into steps three and four now. Yeah. So step three would be, you know, where do you want to be? And and we pretty much have alluded to the fact is that step three is um, very much about the visioneering the future. Where do you want to be? Because if you're here right now, we need to know where there is. Like if you don't have a goal and you don't measure, how, how do you know when you're there? Like if you haven't put the GPS coordinates, you could be driving around aimlessly, wasting a lot of gas, just going around without any purpose or direction. Um, you'll be moving. But do you get where you want to be? But did you decide where you want to go? Like if you book a vacation, you have to decide on a destination yeah. in order to figure out how to get there, right? So, and I think this is where, you know, the, the we talked about visioneering is that having the vision for where you want to go helps it make it more achievable because you know the steps, you've given yourself a blueprint so that you just need to then in step four, which is action. What are the actions I need to take? How do I, uh, I've decided I want to get there but what are the steps? So if I want to lose weight, what does it mean? It means no more, don't go to the grocery store when you're hungry and go down the ice cream aisle. Just like, you know, change up your habits, like make that action, like decide, okay, I want to go running. I'm going to put my running shoes at the bottom of my bed. So when I wake up in the morning, there's no negotiation. It's the decision is made. Like little things like that is starting to tweak your actions, your habits, your mindsets, your and how you naturally do things. And just by a few degrees, just change a few things, right? Instead of waiting until your gas totally runs out of gas, your car runs out of gas, kind of fill it up, maybe, you know, three a quarter of tank left and be able to have a smooth ride, which means self-care is important. We need to know ourselves. Like I know when I'm pushing myself too hard, um, I have very aware of what my body does and how I feel and how things start feeling heavy. And I realize, okay, time to take a, a break, time to sort of, take those actions, but it doesn't come naturally. We have to decide in advance. Like I mentioned, if you decide you want to run a marathon, how about you start with like one mile Yeah. and to motivate yourself to do one mile is hard. So how you do that is you decide the night before I'm going to go for a run and you don't wait until you're tired and grumpy in the morning to decide, no, I'm not, I'm just going to hit the snooze button. It's too much effort to get up. You can even go to sleep in your running clothes. So when you wake up, you don't really have a choice but to get up and go run. (laughs) You know, I kind of call it mind hacking. How can you trick your brain into making the decision when you are in the adult mode of thinking? So when the toddler shows up first thing in the morning and doesn't want to get out of bed, you can say, sorry, honey, we've already decided. Let's go for a run. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I love that. I love the tricking your brain too. Little tricks like, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to jog for... 20 steps <laughs> that's it we're just gonna get for 20 steps and then we'll reevaluate at step 20 uh and it's like well you already started you might as well keep going oftentimes the hardest part is the starting 
Correct, yes. And definitely. mile 25, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, is the worst. My husband's run 10 marathons and he's always like, oh my gosh. So whenever I go watch him, I make sure I'm around about mile 23, mile 22, 23, just before he's like really hitting the wall. I'm like, got this. And he's like, oh, I've got to finish strong now. So, you know, whatever works for you. And like, even I, I call it tricking my brain, like, who in the, on earth loves to do housework? But things that I've realized, if I sit there complaining about it, like, for example, p- doing the dishwasher, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't feel like doing it. But I have to remind myself, you should be grateful you actually have a dishwasher machine. You don't have to do this yourself. But what I'll do is I'll put my ear pods on and I'll put like a podcast or I'll listen to an audio book. And I kind of take my mind somewhere else and I'm just doing the thing. And before I realize it, the dishes in the kitchen is clean. And I actually had fun because I was listening to a, a an audio book that I was find interesting. So it wasn't a waste of time. I just redirected my attention. I took the toddler out of the, the hissy fit mode and put her in front of something that's useful and said, let's do this. And look, you've done two for one. Yeah. So again, you know, finding what works for you and whatever hacks your brain and whatever you feel, um, you know, is imp- it, and you just need to do this by trying a few things and just see what works. Um, but definitely I, Say, go out and try it. Do the one thing and throw yourself a big party. 100%. There we go. Well, if step one was awareness and step two was kind of like the knowing you're here and the somatic experience of it. Step three is the visioneering. What is step four? Is uh, Well, step four is action. So like we basically just talked about action. So doing the do. you decide, doing the, decide what that little thing is, you know, whether it's, um, you know, losing weight, you know, trying and learning a new skill, you know, which means buy a book, listen to a podcast or, you know, put the shoes out the night before, whatever it is to you that just start taking little baby steps. And then eventually the momentum will grow. And before you know it, you'll look back and go, Oh, wow, look at me. I really did it just by starting small. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's when the whole tricking your brain come into play, the small steps, the consistency and the compound effect of it all will really come into play. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. I guess I'm curious. Where do you feel like, what step do you feel like fear stops people the most? Because I feel like fear is something everybody deals with. Do you see people getting stopped at step one because of fear or more like step three or four when they're starting to think big and like what they can actually have for themselves? But really fear can stop us at any stage. This is why we have to make a decision and decide what we want before fear sets in, because it will always try to freak us out. It's that whole putting the brakes on your potential again. And it, and it does, a big part of it is the step one is the awareness of like, oh, this is what's holding me back. And then deciding if I want to change things, oh, it's going to be too hard or it's going to be too inconvenient. And it's easy to make excuses. Like excuses are the easiest thing to do because it, it gives you a reason just to cop out and say, well, that was too hard. Can't do that. Fear is too big. But even in when you, um, like for instance, even when you're starting something new, whether it's like a new exercise routine, there's going to be that fear of the unknown. Oh, what is this going to be like? How hard is this going to be? How much pain is going to be involved? Like how long is this going to take me to get there? Fear shows up in all certain ways. So you have to decide ahead that and know that fear is going to show up. You are going to be challenged. So instead of like, again, the whole anxiety thing, anxiety is us anticipating the worst case scenario. So if we turn around and face the fear and say, I know it's going to be scary. I know I might fall. I know I might hurt and sweat and there might be tears, but I'm deciding now, even before I go through pain, that it's going to be worth it. I mean, every woman in the world who's ever had a baby is going to, could agree with me on this, that you know it's going to be painful, but the end result's going to be so worth it that you can get through that hard stage because the payoff is going to be so much more. So again, I think, you know, overcoming fear and pushing through to the next level is always going to be a choice. But if you can make that commitment to yourself, that no matter what circumstances come at you, you've already decided that it's possible and that it's going to be done, that you are already thinking and envisioning yourself that it's done. If you think about it, like when you see athletes, a lot of them um, always say how they vision and they know what it feels like to win because they've already gone through the motions and they've thought about it in their body, what's well, going to feel like I'm going to like, you know, Michael Phelps is swimming and then I'm going to stand on the podium and this is what it's going to feel like. They kind of micro manage every part of that process. So by the time they get to the race, they know that they're going to win anyway, because they really feel what that feels like. And they've really processed through the motions 
of where it's going to be hard or where they're going to have to push harder. So it never comes as a surprise. So we can remove the fear of the unknown by just simply saying, I know fear is going to try and stop me, but I'm in control and I'm choosing to push through no matter what. Yeah, I love that. Last question for you here. How do you feel like environment plays into this process, both the stimuli in your environment, which we've kind of talked about throughout the podcast, but also the people and the influences you're getting from those people. How does that play into this process? Yeah, environment is actually a very important thing too. Like if you think about it, like a lot of trauma-based experiences happen when we were younger and our body goes, oh, this is imprinting. This is what happens when I do this, it's cause and effect, right? And I've learned to anticipate that. So let's not go down that road because that's going to be painful. That's going to be hurtful. So a lot of the time is, you know, um, if we are in an environment that is constantly feeding us negativity, that's why I say switch off the negative news. It's just going to drive you crazy. Don't put yourself in a situation that's going to be tempting. Like if you're trying to lose weight, don't go shopping when you're hungry or don't don't even go to the grocery down the candy lane. Just, Just don't even go there. So again, it's like understanding what your triggers are and what is the best way to avoid that so you don't feel like your environment is a problem. Now, of course, there's some things in life that, you know, we live with a crazy family member who's going to always trigger us and we just have to learn to like, oh, I'll go to a happy place. But again, it's, you know, we can choose our environments, but we can also choose how we react in those environments. So again, coming back to the awareness, if you know when you go drive driving down this road that people are going to be flying past and going to really get the road rage going, Yep. You can then either go another road, another way, or you can really decide I'm not even going to take the bait and I'm going to just stay in the small, uh, the, the slow lane and stay in my happy place and listen to something else and be and distract myself. So again, it coming, comes back to knowing who you are and what your triggers are and allowing yourself to be aware of like, oh my gosh, that person said that and that really irritated me. Oh, I'm curious because curiosity is a great, a great way of starting to look at things and to start to question why did that trigger me? Hmm. When he said that and she's or she did that, like, oh, why did ooh, that felt horrible? Like, oh my gosh, why am I reacting like that? Like, oh, okay, let's let there's something, there's a wound there. Yep. We just pressed a bruise. We just something hasn't been dealt with. And you know, knowledge is key. If you know what the triggers are, you can deal with them. But if you're in denial, you refuse to look at the triggers, you're gonna just keep going blindly and be bumping yourself like bumper cars and wonder why things hurt. But um, that is what's so so amazing about our minds is that we have the power to choose and we can just start to be aware. So even if you've never really thought about it, like I said, journaling, um, when I was a kid, I used to have journal all the time. Dear diary, you will not believe what so-and-so said, you know, so dramatic. But <laughs> those things are good because, again, writing is another another skill, another tool, because we're in the society, we're so used to typing and that is more of a, a, a functional like a muscle memory process. But if you really want to get into your conscious and your subconscious thinking is to do the old, old fashioned pen and paper, because you have to slow down to understand what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what is it that I'm saying? And almost like documenting the the, the tape and the, the, the drama that's going on up here. And then you start to realize, Oh my gosh, do I talk to myself like that? That's mm-hmm. not very encouraging. I wouldn't talk to my worst enemy like that again. Whatever you can do to become aware, whether it's voice notes, writing down, as long as you can start to take baby steps towards action, then you can, you, then you have um, the tools you need in order to move forward. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Well, Mamika, that's all we got for you today on the show. Is there anything else you want to chat about before we sign off? Um, No, I think we've covered quite a lot, but um, what I will say is if anyone wants any more tools, I have a bunch of tools on my website. Like I have a YouTube channel, I have my book coming out. I also have a free training as well as a download, eight tips to supercharge your mindset that you can go and grab at my website, mamikacooney.com. And I'm on all social media at Mamika Cooney. So come connect with me and I'm always sharing, you know, inspiring content out there. And I always love to hear from people what they found, any aha moments, like, you know, Anything that even what you're going to do, like if you're going to take one of the tools we talked about today and you're going to put it to practice, I'd love to hear your results. So that would be fun. There we go. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Of course. And if you guys loved what Mika had to say, make sure to check her out. All the links to do so that she just talked about will be down in the show notes. Thank you guys for listening. We will see you on the next one. And on that note, we're out.